Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. An update on the massive redesign of Tom Lee Park tonight on Behind the Headlines. with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Carol Collada, CEO of Memphis River Parks Partnership. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being here again. Uh, along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. Um, so we, we thought it was a good time to check in. I think you're about the, the, the redesign and really kind of transformation of the park is about 40% of the way through, I think. With Construction's the, 40% of the way. Yeah. yeah. Target date of sometime next summer, which we'll talk about that to get reopened. Um, and so let me give you just a quick 30 second thing of where, where we stand. We also have some video and some, we'll orient people to this, but just give us the 30 second plus snapshot of where things stand with the uh, park. Yeah, well, we're building a magnificent civic asset on the Mississippi River. Clearly it will be the signature park on this magnificent river. Um, and uh, it's 40% of the way through. We're building it with almost 40% uh, 4% MWBE, Minority and Women Owned Business Enterprises. Um, so I, I feel like it will be an equity and environmental and education uh, and an economic asset for Memphis. Yeah. We, people saw some rendering and now we got some video here. This is uh, showing the new entrance at Vance Avenue coming down into the park. So I think the, the drone is going north to south here along Riverside. Um, it, I toured it uh, with one of your staff members recently, and as much as we have covered it, and you and I have talked about this on the show, and again, the video here is going from south to um, uh, north, so the back of the drone would be, um, uh, I think, pr probably right over the river. It was kind of mind-blowing, actually, how elaborate it is and how much is going on. As much as I, we've, again, we've covered and talked about it, to be driving around and walking around in there, it, it is after, especially what is striking is the park prior to this was a big, very flat field. And to have these sort of low hills and these various areas, and again, it's, it's kind of sketched out. I mean, right there, you can see where it'll be a big civic plaza. You can see maybe some fountains going in. I'm gonna mess this up. But the walks, the hills, a smattering of trees that have been put in, it, it feels very much, even in this construction phase, like an entirely different place. You're not the only one to say that. Uh, the two comments I think we've had most from the people who've toured the park are, A, they can't believe the scope. They yes. say, I didn't realize how big this yes. was. Even for people who have walked the park many times, I, didn't, I, I can't believe the scope. And the other thing that's interesting is I can't believe how much thought has been, been put yeah. into it. And so I think people don't, recognize, I mean, when they think of a park, they think, oh, it's going to be a playground and maybe there'll be a walking path and there'll be some new trees. But when people see what's being built, uh, they are so excited because they just had no idea of the, the number of assets, the number of opportunities there will be in the park to have a great time to relate to others, to just yeah. experience community in a beautiful way. Let me bring in Bill. Um, just about every day, maybe every other day in, 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 in some cases, uh, I go to Butler Park, which is right around the corner from our offices, just, just to have a look at, at how this is, is, is all working. And uh, one, one of the things is, is that you can see trees now in a park that was once famous for having no trees in it. Uh, which is one of the reasons that, that it worked, has worked so well for the Beale Street Music Festival, is just the flatness, the absence of trees. So as the trees start to fill in, is there a person from Memphis and May standing right next to the crane where, where those trees are going to go, worrying about the sideline? How, how does the placement of the trees work in, in that regard? Uh, good question. Uh, if we had not had a mediation agreement uh, that was negotiated by the mayor uh, and Doug McGowan for uh, the, the COO of the city uh, with Memphis and May and Memphis River Parks Partnership, we could never have designed the park. 
to meet the criteria for the two festivals that Memphis and May produces under its uh, banner. Uh, not only Music Fest, but also barbecue. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't, they don't need to be standing there because we know what the requirements are. We know what the lawn requirements are, the linear feet, we know where the backstage needs to be and how much pavement there needs to be, how much, you know, what electrical requirements are, how you get from Riverside Drive, you know, into the park with heavy equipment. We know all of that. And that was all specified in the mediation agreement. That's why it took us so long to, I think, get to the mediation, to, to get res that resolved. If you remember, it was a six month process mm -hmm. after the park had been designed and then sort of redesigned at times to say, well, will this work, will this work? So we re recognized in the end, it's not, we can't design the festival. We're not festival designers. What they needed to provide specifications for their use and then we could design around the specifications and that's Bill what happened. Mm -hmm. um, people have also said, oh, the basketball courts are, are going in because they see the concrete slabs that, that are at the center of the park. Those aren't basketball courts, although they, they could be used for that, right? Correct. They are, though, basketball size. Okay. Memphians love their <laughs> basketball. So there's the center of the Civic Canopy uh, is um, the size of a full-size basketball court. Then there are two ends to that that are each half-size basketball court sizes. But you're right, and we will have basketball goals, by the way, that are removable just as we've had in the past. Um, so the exciting thing is we can use it for basketball, but we can use it for a whole lot more. And that's what that's exactly what we expect to do. It's mm -hmm. going to be a, a phenomenal structure. We've had the first pieces of the roof. It's, it's 20,000 square feet under roof, but open air. And there'll be these beautiful swings that, you know, looking, facing the river that are in the steel structures. Um, you'll have, it's all accessible. Very exciting. It's right in the center of the park, which is the busiest part of the park. That's where the food and beverage, the playground, the fitness area, the uh, restrooms, you know, all the things you need. Uh, there's, a, there's a food truck plaza. So all the things you need, you know, to have a lot of activity will be concentrated in that center area right off the Hewling entrance. Um, and so I think it will be a very active place, uh, both for civic events, for recreation, uh, and also, we hope some rentals. Okay. The, the, um, uh, and, and, <clears throat> and maybe possible now that we talk through some of these things, we might be able to run through the renderings again and the video again as we just c continue to talk. Yeah. If not, that's that's fine. Um, the we, Memphis and May, the mediation. Uh, I mean, wh where are you in terms of uh, the Beale Street uh, Music Fest and Barbecue Fest? Were all done at the fairgrounds this year. Um, they, I think, at least if on the the concert on the Beale Street Music Fest, maybe it was the whole thing, they lost a lot of money. It was a record loss for them. I've heard lots of things about that. Some was, well, that's because they weren't able to be in there, you know, in Tomley Park. Other people, that's because we're coming off COVID. Other people, because they just mismanaged. I don't know, and we don't necessarily have to debate that. We can try to get Memphis and May folks on to talk about where they are. But when will they get back in? And, and how will that, I mean, the details, again, when I toured of how the place is set up and how trucks come in and out is, is really kind of remarkable, actually. I mean, it's, it is just the detail about that. But when will they be back in and will the Barbecue Fest and Music Fest be in the park next year? Well, let me say this. I think because the park has historically been so devoid of any features, any creature comforts, the only way Memphians could think about the park was in, in terms of Memphis and May, right? Because otherwise it didn't feel much like a park. Now, you know, what we have endeavored to do uh, with the help of the mediation agreement is to develop a park that is a gorgeous park that functions 365 days for Memphians um, and visitors, but also accommodates a festival like a Memphis and May. And Memphis and May was helpful in providing those specs to do that. In 2000, I mean, we, all of our construction is outdoors, all right? So, you know, how rainy this past um, winter was, we lost a number of days to rain. Uh, we don't know what will happen next year because we have another year of construction. So essentially what will happen is 
we have said in 20, and the mayor has said, in 2023, we will make the park available to Memphis in May for its festival, its two weekend festivals. Uh, we will also have a grand opening of the park in 2023. It's just they won't be at the same time. So, so because we will not be fully complete with the park, by the time Memphis yeah. and May needs the festival. We have told, we, our board met with their board. They've had that conversation. We've been as transparent as we can be about yeah. what we can deliver. So the good news, I think, is that both can happen. Both um, will happen. We will offer the park yeah. for the festival and we will have a grand opening yeah. in summer of 23. And, and again, we'll bring the renderings up, I think, now. And you can kind of see what, you know, it used to be a big flat field, but you can see those three-ish, I think it's three green mm -hmm. spaces. Those are, the th in part, the three areas where if you've ever been to Music Fest, you would be in those. Barbecue Fest would be in one or all of those three big green spaces. I don't, is all, all, all three, three is the three. anticipation, yeah. but again, that's, that's not our move to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but in the that's that was but, the long-term design, just yep. to orient people to the rendering. Okay. Yep. The, uh, another thing, you know, there are people thrilled about the park and thrilled about the renderings, and there are people who are worried about it and worried about the change. One thing, and Bill brought up the trees that I've heard, the trees in the hills, and I brought up too this kind of sculpting of the place. And so you've heard it, you've seen it. People say, well, now you can't see the river when you ride or drive by down Riverside. And then the other one is when all those trees go in, it's hundreds, thousand trees, it's going to start blocking the view of the river from, for neighbors, from the bluff walk, from anyone on the road. Your response to that? Uh, that's a, a, a concern that is really, um, I, I understand the concern. It shouldn't be a concern, and I think it will be relieved once, once people see the trees go in. Um, the sculpture of the landscape, right, the, the hills, are, are there, they serve a purpose. They're not just for pretty design and, oh, here's another view of the river. It does that. But if you think about traffic on Riverside Drive, four lanes, very fast, a lot of people trying to connect from I-55 to I-40, um, what happens is you need the noise dampening, mostly you need the safety. You look where the hills are, the playground. You're not going to have, you can't have kids playing on a playground right next to speeding traffic. You can't do it. It will be unsafe and miserable. So, and the same thing's true with art. It, it occurs also at the artwork. So the places where you want the park to ensure that it's quieter, it feels safer, will be, that's where the hills are. And I think what they do when you, and, and the view sheds, uh, and we've looked at this in great detail. Um, in fact, we've checked the design team on this. The view sheds from the bluff, from the homes, from the bluff, and from Riverside Drive are absolutely preserved. They're just framed. It's not, it, it's not as if you have, I mean, you used to have a 180, right? There was nothing in your way. But framed views are actually in yeah. many ways, as you know, more pleasant. How many, other than Memphis and May, how many, roughly how many visitors a year to the park in the past? <laughs> well, in the, in the 11 months of the year, or tw we, 10 months? We don't we know. What, I will, what, we okay. do kn what we do know, though, is that once River Garden, the beautiful little park that was converted from Jeff Davis Park, which also was pretty much devoid of features except some great trees, uh, when we converted it uh, to what it is now, River Garden, we would have 15 and 20 times the um, number of people yeah. in that space than we would in Tomley Park. And do you expect that in the, the bulk of the park? I mean, oh, a, a 10 to 15 to 20 oh, times increase, yeah. At least. Yeah, Bill. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we've talked about the park landscape and, and how it's changed, there's another change, another reorientation for people using the park who are used to mostly coming in from Beale Street, walk crossing Riverside at, at Beale Street. The whole goal here, is that people will come in from the bluff top parks, Hewling, Butler, and, and Vance in, in, in those areas. Do you think people are, are waking up to that or are kind of discovering that, that reorientation into the park 
from the top of the block? It's, that's a really good question. I, first of all, I don't believe that the north entrance to the park, you know, from Beale, because c consider we're also redoing the cobblestones right, right now, mm -hmm. and we have River Garden on the other end. So I think what's going to happen is people will continue to come in from the north, but they will also have those the beautiful Cutbank Bluff, first accessible, ADA accessible way to get from the bluff to and the bank. Rendering is up. Sorry yes. to interrupt you right there. You can that, see, and it, that's pretty well done. It's not all grown in, but you can uh, see you it can, if you drive by, walk by. Yeah. And the lights just went in yeah. Uh, yeah. this week, which we're really excited about. Um, and in fact, some stone benches yeah. have gone in, and this is going to all green up. Yeah. Um, that is um, an important entrance because of the accessibility. I live on Union Avenue, and I, I you know, uh, I had some medical issues recently, and I'd get you know halfway up my block and think I got to stop, and take a rest. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's really nice to have the ADA accessible. And then there's parking all over downtown, especially nights and weekends when people are looking for it to go to the park, early morning, uh, you know what you the and weekends. So it's really important to be able to access the park from the parking that already exists all over downtown. Use that parking, you know heavily, uh, it makes everything work and it mm -hmm. makes it a downtown. I mean, it's funny when people talk about, oh, we don't have enough parking right at the door. And you're thinking, well, if you have a lot, too much parking at the door, we've had that. That was in 68, 70, 71, 72. Downtown doesn't really feel like a downtown if you've got surface parking all over it. Nobody says that's a good downtown. So finding a way to use the existing parking and then get the connectivity. We still, though, Bill, have to work on the connectivity. I mean, that is, and when I say that, what I mean is right off the bluff going east, you've got to make sure the sidewalks exist, you know, the railroad crossings are up good. Up above the bluff. Up, up above, above the, the bluff. Yeah. And mm -hmm. That's not your control. It's not my control, but we're certainly advocating for it because yeah. that's one thing I think Memphis has frequently not gotten quite right. Uh, Eric is is the connectivity. It's like we get a lot of stranded assets that I think is one of the great things about like the Green Line and all of the the connectivity that is um, that's being built. And you know we we need to be joined up as yeah. a community. Well, and and in fact, Doug McAllen, uh, the city's chief operating officer, was was talking to council members several weeks ago, and as part of the discussion. He talked about the cobblestones, uh, which that work is, it is underway as, as we speak too. And I, he didn't dwell on this a lot, but are there, are there going to be some parking spaces at that area where the cobblestones meet Tom Lee Park at, at Beale Street Landing? Doug had told the council there would be, and um, you know that certainly is up to the city. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting, again, as someone who lives downtown uh, for 45 years, uh, it, it is, it, you have to be careful about how you provide parking and whether you charge for it, when you, ch when you charge for it, how long people can stay, because um, you get, un there are unintended consequences, right? But, but uh, parking is anticipated based on um, uh, Chief McGowan's uh, comments on the south end of the cobblestones, and you're right, that's that's directly uh, adjacent to Beale Street Landing and Tonley Park. It, it sounds like there are still some details to be worked out on that. Well, uh, those are details that Doug will work out. Okay. I mean that. Okay. Uh, right. a, a couple things. The with this big park, the other thing, and just all the the amenities we're talking about in the kind of complexity. And again, I talked about. Uh, people can kind of see it in the video and the renderings, but also having gone through it, and it's everything you said, like, it's so much bigger, it's so much more complicated, it's just there's more to it. So there's gonna be a huge amount of expense associated with that, right? I mean, the upkeep of that, the upkeep of the park will go up, I would assume, dramatically. How, it's a free and open park, and I say this as someone who used to be on the board of the Overton Park Conservancy, it's always a challenge when your mission is to maintain a clean, inviting, safe, free and open park, it's really hard to pay for those things. This is even more elaborate than, may not be as big as Overton Park, but it's more elaborate, it seems, it, just to the, the person you know, walking and uh, riding through there. How are you gonna pay for it all? Well, let, let me first say, we take care of 250 acres of riverfront every day. Uh, some of which is floodplain, I mean, some of which is on you know bluffs that are tough to maintain. So I, I say that 
in that unlike um, Overton Park Conservancy or Shelby Farms Conservancy when they were first formed, we've been taking care of Riverfront for 20 plus years. Um, city built assets that we then operate and, and uh, manage. There will be an increase in cost, but the good news is we have, you know, we also have a team, we also have equipment, we have a lot of things that will allow us to do that. We've just brought on a landscape uh, architect who will uh, manage, help us manage the sustainable landscaping. Right. Um, and of course the contractor, you know, takes care of it for the first two years. So it also get, gives us a chance to understand how to operate right. it. The good news is, um, the revenues that we receive, for instance, from docking fees continue to rise. Yeah. And with the mayor's uh, plan to increase uh, the size of the Beale Street Landing Dock and add a more formal dock at Greenbelt, that will allow us to accommodate the increasing numbers. So that is a re that's an earned revenue stream for us that will allow us to do that work. Over and above the maintenance of the docks and the, the work to get stuff on. Yes. Up. Roughly how many boats are coming in now and what, it, it's, it's gonna double over the next couple of years, right? It, it will and we've got one new cruise line coming yeah. in this summer, Viking. Yeah, okay. But is it about 10 a year now or is it more than that? 10. How many is it? I really no, don't know. It's about 64 like for I the said, last 64. <laughs> no, no, the last six months. That's what I said. So, yeah, <laughs> right. Check the tape. Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, the, they are significant and it's there's hardly a summer day. It's 64 overnight boats? Yeah. I had no idea. Um, so and and, and they're, they're there all the time. If, yeah, I, I really, I, I, I shouldn't have said 10, but I really had no idea it was no. 64. Uh, with a couple well, months, that's half a year. That's half a year, yeah. Yeah, so that's not an annualized yeah. figure. So okay. that's January to yeah. June. Um, with a few months left, Mud Island, um, the, the city, we talked about the city, recently made some noise about it. They, there's some money that's going to go to possibly fix the monorail. What's the future of Mud Island? And is it is it, a, is it staying with you? Is it staying with Memphis River Parks Partnership? Or is is does it need to have a separate entity running it? Or what's the future of Mud Island? Um, it doesn't need to have a separate entity. In fact, that's the real reason this organization was created. Uh, but that's because the city didn't know what to do with it. The city was out of options. It's like, I was just reading an article from 2001, Eric, that said, you know, the problem, nobody goes to Mud Island. There's, that's 2001. Yeah. These are not new problems. They are 40 years, Mud Island opened 40 years ago last week. Oh. So. And for 40 years, we haven't reinvested in it. And the program, right, got dated. It was dated and it didn't attract people. And people are very nostalgic about it, but you also have to say, how do people behave today? So the good news is council and we really, and the administration working together have stepped up to provide $4 million from Accelerate Memphis and $5 million uh, out of the CIP to do basic, improvements in the um, deferred maintenance of Mud Island. I mean, escalators, elevators, the basic stuff. None of it's sexy, but all of it's necessary. Um, and the council provided, uh, under the leadership of Councilwoman uh, Michael and Easter Thomas, provided us with some money to do some visioning for Mud Island. And we are choosing to do that visioning, not with a bunch of pretty pictures, but really looking at three or four alternative scenarios, words and numbers, uh, that will allow us to say, how might Mud Island's future develop? And what would that mean in terms of where the investment would come from, how much the public would be expected to put in, what are the public benefits? And then be able to have a, have a starting point that is not just what Mud Island was 40 years ago. Two minutes, Bill. Um, the the uh, expansion of the boat docks is is not only at Beale Street Landing, it's also on the river side of Mud Island on Greenbelt Park, which I believe is, is also part of the partnership's yes. responsibilities as well. Will that, will that overnight cruise a activity there, will that be a new source of activation for Mud Island as a whole, not, not just the river park? Um. Oh, that's a good question, but the way cruise ships operate is they bring passengers on buses from hotels mm -hmm. and load almost immediately. I mean, they don't use the inside of Beale Street Landing, which I think was a surprise to everyone. Right. They, um, 
they load you on the boat. When you get off the boat, they typically put you on a bus or you're getting on an Uber to go to a hotel, right? So, they're, and they're taking you around Memphis on the bus. Uh, so you're going to Graceland, you're going to these features. What we hope is that with Tom Lee Park, people will want to stay longer, right? And in, in the place and while they're waiting. We think Tom Lee Park will become an attraction to the boats, which would be great. But uh, I don't really see that happening at Greenbelt um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but we use, Greenbelt's very important because sometimes the water's too low to dock at Beale Street Landing, mm -hmm. which is the reason you need that dock. It's not preferred. We are out of time. Thank you very much for being here. You mentioned health issues. We're glad to see you. Glad you're here. Glad you're on the right side of all that. So thanks so much. Thank thanks. you, Bill. Um, if you missed any of the show, you can get the full episode online at WKNO.org, or you can get the full podcast of the show at iTunes, Spotify, on the Daily Memphian site, wherever you get your podcast. Thanks very much. Next week, Beverly Robertson, outgoing chair or head of the Chamber of Commerce. Thanks. We'll see you then.